What's up guys? Welcome to Talk Wrestling here on NoDQ.com and of course everywhere else around the internet that you're watching us, whether it be MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, wherever. Thank you for watching. We appreciate you guys watching each and every week. Um, we'll get to what's going on this weekend in a little while, but uh, for now let's get to your questions and your and my DVD and book review. Alright, this one comes from Mason Marchand. I'm wondering what your favorite stage setups are of all time, Raw, SmackDown, and pay-per-views. I like the Raw set they used up until the first draft with Vince and Rick. The SmackDown Fist, I like the King of Rings set in 2001, I believe, where Angle and Shane had a street fight. Anyway, take care, Jeff, and good luck to your Kings. Got to see hockey fans in SoCal. I'm a oh, he's a Senators fan from Canada. Okay. We're playing them. We played them last week. Ottawa Senators like played them last week. Yeah. Good game. Um, Raw-wise, my favorite setup is... I mean, besides the current era, because I do like the new setup that they have, the, the, the unisex, unisex, unibrand uh, setup. The Raw setup from Raw's War was good. I liked that one with the big Tron. And the um, SmackDown Fist is definitely my favorite SmackDown set. The old Tron was kind of lame, to be honest with you. Um, Pay-per-view wise, I gotta go with WrestleMania 20, the New York City setup. That was a great setup. All right, this is from Alejandro Rivera. What was your favorite Kurt Angle match in the WWF slash WWE? Honestly, of all the matches Kurt Angle had in WWE, which spans, you know, seven years, I do believe. I could be wrong there. My favorite Kurt Angle match was the match, the cage match he had with Chris Benoit on Raw in 2001. It was before the night, the 2001 King of the Ring. It may have been even before the Austin Benoit match in Edmonton in 2001. I, I don't remember exactly when it happened on Raw, but it was one of the best cage matches I've ever seen and my favorite Kurt Angle match. And people are going to disagree with me on that. People are going to say, well, you know, what about his King of the Ring victory? What about his WWF Championship victory? What about his, you know, match with Shawn Michaels, WrestleMania 21? Those are all very good. But that match with Chris Benoit, that match with Chris Benoit and the Royal Rumble 2003 match with Chris Benoit, those are my two. I forgot about that one. Those are my two favorite Kurt Angle matches. Both those guys were showcased so well in that. Both those guys did such a great job. I recommend both those matches, along with the DVD I recommended earlier, uh, if I haven't done it already. Um, just great matches from both guys. This person didn't send their name, just their email, so I apologize if I butcher the... Uh, I'm just going to spell it out. And that's, save, me, save me a lawsuit. L E E H A S K L E Lee Haskell, I guess, at att.net. Do you think ECW will ever go to a two hour show? I like ECW. I think it's a good way to learn about some of the younger talent in the business. I think it needs to be a longer show to create better storylines. Well, I talked a little bit about ECW last week. Um, and what they're going to do with it is going to be a developmental show. So to make it two hours is a bad idea if they're going to go that way because. One hour, showcase certain guys every week, and let, let the fans see what they're going to get in the future. No, definitely not uh, Definitely not two hours. And um, uh, It is a good way to learn about the younger talent, but don't make it two hours because that's going to be overkill. All right, this week's DVD review comes from Logan Curtis. It is one of my favorite WWE DVDs, strictly because the man himself signed it. Very funny. To Jeff, this is the best DVD ever, Rob Van Dam. Exactly what it says right there. RVD, one of a kind. Um, let me hold up here so you can look at the cover. Just because it's autographed and it's pretty. I like it. Um, I was impressed with this one. You know, They picked a lot of good matches. Uh, they picked some old WCW matches, which was surprising to me. Because I didn't even know Rob Van Dam was in WCW until I saw this DVD. I had no idea. No clue. And then, uh, I got this the first time I interviewed him, right, Aaron? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he agreed that as long as we promoted on the show that he would give me a free copy, so I get a free copy, and then I'll autograph out of it. <laughs> Good stuff. Anyway, so we got that. It's, it's a great DVD. It's got, I mean, 
Rob talks about a little bit of his life, talks about a little bit of, you know, growing up in the business and everything like that, but it's mainly just matches, which is good. Um, and it's, it's straight up Rob. There's no kayfabe slob like The Edge or Kane DVDs. This is Rob as Rob. This is good quality entertainment, and I know I'm being biased because it's Rob Van Dam, but you know what? I recommend this one wholeheartedly. If you're a fan of wrestling matches, if you're a fan of good style wrestling, go buy this. This is from 2004. So it doesn't have his WWE Championship win, but it does have one of the best matches ever between him and Jerry Lynn from Leaving Dangerously on Mar in March of 99. It's got a great match with him and Christian from Raw in September 2003. It's got his invasion match with Jeff Hardy from July 01. Um, it's got the last ever ECW match, I believe, ever. Yeah, between him and Jerry Lynn from Guilty as Charged 2001. Uh, pretty sure it was the last ECW match ever, the original ECW anyway. Um, and there's alternate commentary on these. Um, two of them, I believe the alternate commentary is Rob Van Dam and uh, The Coach, I believe. Could be wrong. Could be Michael Cole. I haven't watched it in a while. But yes, go see this. Go buy this. Go pick it up at RobVanDam.com. RobVanDam.com, I think they still have it there. Uh, look on WWE.com if they have it. If they don't, find it on eBay. Every wrestling fan should have this DVD and send it to RobVanDam.com. He'll sign it for you. All right. Uh, this one comes from Dave. Yeah, Dave, sorry. If you could book Bret Hart to become a, as a manager, advisor, mentor, whatever, to the Hart Dynasty to help them win the tag titles, how would you book the angle where he comes out? Boy, the twist. He totally blanks Tyson Kidd as he is not a true Hart family member. Um, honestly, with the Hart Dynasty, I like them. But what I would do if Brett came out is I would have him just blast Tyson. If you're going to have me blast Tyson, that's what I'll do for you. Just blast Tyson, knock him out, have David Hart Smith just cold cock him and bring in Teddy. Teddy's a true heart. He's, uh, I believe, Georgia's, Georgia Hart's son, Brett's sister's son. So he is truly Brett's nephew. Yes, Tyson did graduate from the Hart Dungeon. But you know what? Um, Teddy's a true heart family member. So I say bring Teddy in and replace Tyson if you're going to do it that way. I, I say bring Teddy in anyway. Replacing Tyson or not. Bring Teddy in and bring Brett in to manage him. Why the hell not? This one is from Nick Giles. Do you think the WWE could pr improve its product if they started using jobbers like they did back in the 80s and 90s? Honestly, I get tired of seeing the same handful of matches week in and week out. There's no incentive to order a pay-per-view because I can see the same match during the week. There's also the added benefit of character development as well. If you put a jobber in a match against a heel, the crowd would naturally side with the unknown jobber. Give him a few matches, let him cut a promo telling the heel he's going to beat him. Let the jobber actually beat the heel. Presto, instant character of the crowd is behind. It won't be hard to put that guy over at all. Um, well, that's kind of an iffy one, and the, and the panel says so, um, that's kind of an iffy one because there's only so many jobbers you can use on TV before the product just gets one-sided. The reason they do the main event guy versus main event guy is because they want people to watch the show on TV and get the ratings. So if you're going to have, you know, Randy Orton versus Buck Zumoff, you know, you're not going to see, you're not, you know, you know who's going to win that match. You don't know who's going to win between Randy Orton and Kofi Kingston week in and week out. You don't know who's going to win that match. You don't know if, you know, CM Punk's going to beat Jeff Hardy. Jeff Hardy's not there anymore. But, you know, you, you, you honestly don't know. That's the added thrill of the current WWE product is you don't know who's going to win the match, show in, show out. You don't know who's going to win those matches. It, it, on any given night, anybody can get an upset. So even the low card guys, main mid card guys, could be the main eventer on any given night. Look at Kofi Kingston beating Randy Orton. That's a great example. Look at Sheamus being the number one contender for the WWE Championship. Who would ever thought? Who would have ever thought? Just saying. This is from Charles Thomas. Do you think Bret Hart should have been given a WCW World Heavyweight title push when he was in WCW before Goldberg ended his career? That match was for the championship. You realize this. This is. I'm sorry to do this to you, Charles, but oh. Aaron Facepalm, we had one this week. Uh, somebody asked if we should. If Bret should be given a WCW title push before he retired. 
Two-time champion, right? Yeah. Brett was WWE champion. He won the title at Mayhem in November. He beat Chris Benoit in the finals. And then voluntarily gave it up after the big controversy at Starcade regarding the finish with Roddy Piper. The next night at Nitro, he formed the NWO 2000 with Nash, Hall, I believe Jared at the time, Steiner joined later, and just obliterated Goldberg and Piper in the process of regaining the World Heavyweight Championship. He won the match when uh, Piper pinned Goldberg. I'm not kidding. Oh, that was on Nitro. Yes. Right, because Piper pinned... Goldberg Piper was protecting Goldberg, Goldberg so, so Brett pinned Brett pinned Piper, and that's how they pinned Goldberg. I remember that. You're right. Yes. Look it up on YouTube. Look it up in the death in the death of WCW. I'm reviewing that next week, by the way. The death of WCW. Great read. Great book. <laughs> so true. All of it. It's all true. That's the sad part. The whole book is true. It's so one sided and so biased, but it's all true. Anyway, I'll get to that next week. Um. Yes, Brett was a two-time WWE champion. He was given the push. The only thing that stopped him was the fact that he got a blow to the head. Goldberg kicked him right in the chops. And it just it destroyed his career and ended up causing him a stroke. So Brett was a two-time WWE champion. He, they, they finally gave him a push after being there for almost three years. But he got it. And uh, there you go. Thanks for the tw tw Sorry, Charles, but face palm, brother. Sorry, man. Not as bad a face palm as WCW in general during that time, but still a face palm nonetheless. This is from Tommy Butler. Do you think WWE should induct Triple H and Shawn Michaels and the DX stable in the Hall of Fame the same year? Um, no. And honestly, I don't think that you're going to see any of the other four DX, five DXers, maybe Rick Rude, but not for being in DX. Rick Rude will be in the Hall of Fame for being Rick Rude. But I don't think you'll see Road Dog, Billy Gunn, China, or X Pac conducted in the Hall of Fame. And Triple H and Shawn Michaels each deserve their own year. They they can build the entire Hall of Fame program around a Triple H or around a Shawn Michaels. Like, you know, Stone Cold was the main attraction last year? Who who's the main guy this year? Who's that? Just say it. More. I don't know. Um, no, wait, no. no. Austin was the main guy this year. 2009. Okay, yeah, Austin was the main guy this year. They built the whole Hall of Fame around Steve Austin. In 2007, 2006, excuse me, it was Bret Hart. 2005, of course, it was the Hulkster. 2004, they really didn't have one because it was the first one. But they've, they've tried to build the entire Hall of Fame around the one big superstar. You know, 2008, they didn't have the one big superstar. They had a whole bunch of different guys. So, Flair. That should have been, but the fact that The Rock showed up and The Rock inducted his family, that, you know, they get... Dude, you weren't there live. I, I've told this story on the show, but they gave Rock so much time, they had to cut Flair's time. That was bullshit. Should have been Flair's night. But they gave The Rock the superstar time. Go figure. Anyway... So, no, they should give Triple H one year and Shawn Michaels a different year. Or, you know, Shawn Michaels first, then Triple H, though, for sure. All right, this book review for the week comes from Jimmy Shorts. Thank you, Jimmy, for sending the request for The Stone Cold Truth by, of course, Stone Cold Steve Austin with Jim Ross helping, as told to Dennis Brent. Um, much like last week's with Lawler's book, I go back and forth this one. I like reading this one personally. But it's because I'm such a big Stone Cold fan and always have been. I, I liked him when he was still stunning Steve back in WCW and even the USWA when I was following the wrestling mags. Um, but I don't know if I'd recommend it to the general wrestling reader. I mean, I mean, if you're a wrestling fan, you'll like Stone Cold's book because Stone Cold's the biggest, one of the biggest superstars in the history of the business. But I don't know if I would recommend it for everybody. You know, it, it, it's it's an easy read. That's for sure. He doesn't really go into a whole lot of detail about everything, though. He kind of just, you know, grazes over everything, doesn't talk about the divorces, doesn't talk about, you know, the behind-the-scenes stuff too much. Sorry for the nose itch. I really apologize, you guys. Just, I'm sick. I'm sorry. Um, so if, if you're into it for a light read, by all means, pick it up and read it and buy it. But um, if you want more in-depth stuff like... 
you know, Flair does, or like Brett does, or like, you know, even the Shawn Michaels to a certain extent does, then uh, this is not the book for you. Sorry, Steve. This is from Brittany Womble. Hey, it's a girl, I think. <laughs> there are some guys named Brittany, so I don't know. If you could bring back one tag team, who would it be and why? Mine would have to be Paul London and Brian Kendrick. Because they were an awesome tag team. They were the longest reign WWE Tag Team Champions. And I also believe they could have been the unified WWE Tag Team Champions. Well, they were also World Tag Team Champions for a uh, cup of coffee on the house show circuit. Lennon, uh, Caden Murdoch won them back not too long after. Of all the teams you could bring back, it would be Lennon and Kendrick. Hmm. If I could bring back any team ever, and I mean ever, I would have to bring back the Hart Foundation. As long as they're not in the shape that Anvil's in now, and Brett's you know, not in good shape either because he had a stroke, God bless him. Uh, you know, If they brought back Brett and the Anvil in their primes, go for it, dude, by all means. Uh, the Hart Foundation is my favorite tag team of all time. So, One team I wouldn't bring back, just, just, despite what Aaron wants Dixie Carter to do, I would not bring back the Nasty Boys. Because those guys are crazy, and Brian Knobs looks like hell. And I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bring back the Mega Maniacs, either. Hard foundation I'd bring back, for sure. All right, this one is from John Martin. What do you think of Dustin Rhodes, more popularly known as Goldust? What do you think about his current in-ring skills, and do you think he has at least one more major title push to go before he retires? Goldust will never, ever hold a title again unless they bring back a third tier title like a European or a hardcore they're not going to make him be the you know intercontinental champion or the US champion maybe a tag title run if they bring in the right partner for him but I mean he's partnered with Hornswoggle most recently give me a break come on that's just not going to happen I don't think so you know um no Goldbust is going to be a enhancement talent at best the rest of his career. And that's sad because I like Goldust. I actually had the opportunity to see him. I didn't go see him, but I had the opportunity to last year before he came back to WWE when he was still Dustin. And uh, I missed out, and I'm sad I missed out because Dustin's a great worker. It just, you know, Goldust, Dustin, whatever, is not going to get a WWE title push ever again. Maybe TNA, but not WWE. This is from Donnie Elliott. Why do you think Rey Mysterio got a push after, after Eddie Guerrero died and not Chavo Guerrero? Thank you! Somebody asked this question. I get the WWE wanted to push someone close to him, but I think it would have been made more sense to go with an actual family member. Thank you! My God! I'm not saying that Chavo Guerrero deserves to be world champion, because Lord knows Chavo Guerrero was not over the way Rey Mysterio was back then. But you know what? If you're going to push somebody in the absence of Eddie Guerrero, push Chavo! Jesus Christ, bring back the Gooker! Push Hector! You know, don't push a family friend. Yes, I understand that Rey is over with the kids. I understand that people love Rey Mysterio. But you know what? He's not a credible main eventer. The guy is 5'3", 175 pounds. All my fats have to do is sit on him and he's, his ribs are broken for weeks. He's not a credible main eventer. Chavo really isn't either. Chavo is a good cruiserweight as well. But... If you're going to push someone in the absence of Eddie Guerrero because of his passing, push the family. That's why Vicky got a big spot. That is it once again for Talk Wrestling. Again, thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time on Talk Wrestling.